Um, let me start. Sure. Um, Greg, what is at stake in these elections? Well, this is the most important election Indonesia has seen since probably the 99 election. Uh, to put it in crude terms, this may well be the last hurrah of the new order. Uh, if the Prabowo fails, the team around him is very much a new order team. If he succeeds, we may in some ways see the new order resurrected. It won't be back exactly the same, but some of the same issues with authoritarianism and, and cronyism and, and nepotism and, and, and the kleptocracy will return for sure. Um, what are Indonesians looking for? Well, Indonesians are looking like, like voters all around the world. They're looking for their prince. The, 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 well, the man on horseback, as probably recognises, hence his appearance on horseback at his uh, campaign launch. They're looking for the strong leader who will save them. And this year, more than most, because they've had five years of the second term of the Indonesian government, the perception is that Yudhiyono has been frozen, uh, has been inert, and, and has lost opportunity after opportunity. It's cost him very badly with his party. He doesn't have a candidate in this election. Uh, people are saying, whatever we want, we don't want that. So it's a kind of a reaction to what they've had for the last five years. Right. And that's been the main selling point for Prabowo, and it's worked very well for him. Uh, with the debate, the final debate Saturday night, we finally saw Jokowi come forward and look just as firm, just as Degas, as Prabowo has been or planning to be. But it's a matter of perceptions. Yep. And Prabowo, I think, was very right to recognize that the one thing to emphasize in selection is that you would be a firm, strong leader. Now, in many ways, both candidates are, but Prabowo has been man managing that perception better than Jokowi until very recently. So given all of this, based on what you've seen and you've been observing every movement, uh, who's going to win? It's incredibly tight, and if we'd had this conversation a month ago, we wouldn't have said it was going to be tight. Uh, even a few weeks ago, uh, the gap was significant. Uh, it seems like Jokowi has a, has a lead still that he can maintain. Uh, if we had a conversation Saturday morning, the Saturday before the election, uh, I think I would have told you that I think Prabowo has finally swung ahead. Uh, come Sunday, uh, Prabowo uh, did okay in, in the Saturday night debate, but Jokowi was brilliant. He, he, was, he was the debater he always should have been. And he came into the debate in the high because he had this very large 80,000, whatever it was, mass rally concert uh, in the center of the city, not organized by PDIP, but organized by his own team. So he's now on a high, and he's just gone off to make Umbra, a minor pilgrimage, uh, which is probably a very smart way of communicating during the non-campaign period that actually you are a pious Muslim and you really do fit in as Indonesia's potential leader. Uh, so he is, I think, swung back ahead now, but by Wednesday it, it may all have changed and it would only take a couple of, you know, maybe a single incident to tip things around. There's a lot of undecided voters, maybe as many as 20%, but certainly, you know, more than 10%. And, and if you ask people, uh, just anecdotally, they will often say, I honestly don't know who to vote for. I'm just, you know, I'll, I'll respond on the day. I think most people want to turn up. They don't want a goal put. They don't want to have a, a, a non-valid protest vote. They want to have a valid vote but they honestly don't know because they can see good and bad, not just with both candidates, but with both, uh, with both camps, with both teams. Yes. And for some people, it's, it's the um, fellow travelers that may be the incentive or the disincentive in their selection. These two candidates, um, it's very stark. How would you describe each one? Well, Jokowi uh, is you, you're very much your ordinary man. He's the every man, the guy you'd meet in the street, maybe the guy who's driving the taxi you're in. Uh, he, he looks ordinary, he sounds ordinary, he's not particularly charismatic, he's smart enough, but in a very everyman style. Prabowo is, is tough and articulate and, and charismatic. Uh, to look at still photographs of them, you may not get that impression, but to hear, hear, hear both of them speak, Prabowo is, is the more articulate, charismatic performer. But Prabowo tends in, intuitively to a, a very authoritarian tough man style, which sells well, but it's also his liability. It reflects his, uh, his career in the military. Mm -hmm. And Prabowo comes across as an earnest uh, do-gooder who's also actually a micromanager. And it's that micromanagement which has uh, been part of the, the, the baggage with his campaign and part of, uh, I think, one of the, the, the burdens he carries in terms of trying to get his image across. But he does care. He, yeah. he, his micromanagement is about really caring about how things work out. And he's done a good job as mayor of Solo, two terms, and now as governor of Jakarta. Uh, so despite what the Prabowo camp claims, he does have a, a, a decent track record. And, and the track record for Prabowo is actually quite mixed. Um, what are the dangers of both these candidates? 
The dangers, uh, with both of them, we don't know what their economic policies will be. Indonesian democracy has been a wonderful success, but it's been largely a policy-free zone. And when policy does rear its head, it's often in the form of nationalist rhetoric, which is not particularly helpful for an economy that needs to grow even more than it has been doing. Yeah. Uh, so there's a danger with either that uh, Indonesia is facing global challenges with its economic growth. And if it doesn't get really spectacular growth, more like seven, eight plus percent, mm -hmm. it's not going to reach its potential. Uh, and it's, it's going to require a lot of hard work and discipline and, 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 and team playing. Prabowo will have a better team, a better coalition around him. Uh, Jokowi may really struggle to form that team. He doesn't have the numbers in parliament, he has a minority in parliament, and he's burdened with his main ally, PDIP, which is very much a mixed blessing. Yeah. Prabowo, if he becomes president, uh, his biggest liability, uh, people may say, is his past, human rights abuses allegedly, uh, but it's actually the present and the future. It's his temperament, which is probably tied up with those past allegations. He's quick to get angry and uh, that might be kept in check and he may make a very effective president, but it could also go very badly wrong. So Prabowo is your high risk option. He's double or nothing. He may get a brilliant result or it may go very badly. Uh, Jokowi is relatively safer, less risk, r risky, but there's a risk also that he just won't, um, he won't soar in the way that he, he and the country should. In many ways, uh, in terms of his earnestness and his sincerity uh, and his non-political professional style, Jokowi is a little bit like Barack Obama. Doesn't have the soaring uh, rhetoric and eloquence uh, and doesn't have the charisma. But he has that same, you know, dogged, earnest uh, goodness about him, uh, which is a positive thing, but it's also uh, in politics, in real politics, uh, carries carry some liabilities. How was Prabowo able to remake himself? I mean, if you go from 97, 98 until today, I mean, to be this close to the presidency, it's not something we could have predicted. No, and, and, and in some ways it's a remarkable thing that, that uh, elicits a degree of admiration, even for those who are quite concerned about his rise. Uh, he's just worked very, very doggedly. He's put together a strong, large coalition. Partly uh, he's been helped by failures on the Jokowi side, uh, and he's put together a team that works in a modern, professional, uh, real politic fashion, but also is, is um, uh, at its limit, fairly amoral. It, it will do whatever it takes. Um, so in, in a sense, um, in the period of the World Cup, um, the Prabowo team is the better team, but they also don't respect the rules. They'll do whatever it takes to win. This, do Indonesians see this? Do they see this? They do see this. Um, not all of them see it the same way. One of the factors that isn't immediately obvious is that most, well, many voters um, voting uh, on Wednesday have no clear adult memory of the Suharto era. Uh, even those who were, who were just coming into adulthood and they, and they were actually a minority uh, in, the, uh, in the Suharto era uh, have, you know, a, a small number of intellectuals and activists remember very clearly the, the dark days of 98. But most of the voters uh, don't have that clear memory, and many of them are so young that they just don't remember it at all, or it, they, don't, they don't put it in context. It's one of those grey areas, they don't know how to make sense of it. And uh, so intuitively they recoil from the hardness of the Prabowo team, but it, I mean, you throw mud and it sticks, and all this black campaigning has not been without effect. Yeah. So it's, it's a double-edged uh, sword for the Prabowo team that uh, it may work against them, but so far it's worked in their favour. In, in Jokowi's case, again, I've seen him compared to Barack Obama, but also compared to Gus Dur, a man with great moral authority, but in the end was indecisive and wasn't not necessarily a good leader. Is this no, fair? Uh, it's a fair point given that the backdrop of the second Yudhiyono term, I think, has made it possible for Prabowo to have this great leap forward that he's had. I mean, he's come forward as the can-do, tough, to Gus, the firm leader. And I don't know that it would have been so easy if it wasn't for the second Ileono term. Uh, in that context, uh, Jokowi is at a weakness because uh, whilst he clearly knows how to do things and run things, his style of micromanagement and his lack of concern for protocol and, and, and you know, doing things the right way uh, means that he, he may end up um, perhaps a little bit less like Barack Obama and more like Jimmy Carter. Oh. Uh, for yeah. for yeah. those who can remember who Jimmy Carter Yes. Um, and what is his main strength? How, 
how did he capture the imagination of Indonesians um, when he was elected governor? For a little while, all you could hear, was, you could feel the excitement coming out of it. Indeed, in the, if we go back two years to the governorial election, I mean, we would have thought it's, it's, a, it's a governor of Jakarta, it's a special district, yes, but I mean, it's not that important, who cares? Well, Indonesians cared tremendously about that election and they were very, very excited when J Jokowi won against the odds, when uh, he, he, he won with an ethnic Chinese running mate who may well take over as governor of Jakarta, of course, if he becomes president. And uh, against all sorts of black campaigning, he won against the odds. And he comes through as the decent, uh, honest, non-political guy that uh, many people have been longing for. But move forward two years, and Prabowo has been very effective at saying, yeah, Mr. Jocko is a nice guy. No one's arguing against that. But is he mad enough for the job? And that's the, that's the edge that Prabowo has been pushing. But Jokowi's appeal is that he is such a decent, nice, genuine guy. He seems uncorruptible. There doesn't seem to be any dirt to be found on him. Hence the black campaigning has gone to this, almost like the, the anti-Obama birther campaign, crazy speculation, probably not even based on genuine conviction that he's not a proper Muslim or maybe of Chinese ancestry or whatever, just as long as you can get a line out that sticks in the, in the minds of some. Uh, and, but that desperation comes from the fact that otherwise it's very hard to attack him. Um, technology. What is the role of technology in these elections? Well, if we go back to the beginning of this sort of era of, 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 of uh, technology and, and uh, presidential elections, the uh, JFK Richard Nixon televised debate, of course, yes. famously yes. Uh, was a turning point. Yes. Um, well, for this uh, campaign, a little bit like the second uh, Obama uh, campaign, we're seeing the rise of social media. And so in Indonesia, uh, Facebook is important, um, but it's really Twitter that's the big thing. Uh, and, and, and Twitter can multiply very quickly. It snowballs, of course, as things cascade. Mm -hmm. It's also vulnerable to Twitter bots and all kinds of spamming. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's a very good venue, medium for, uh, for black campaigning. So it's been a mixed blessing, but it's been a large factor. Most Indonesians don't read newspapers. They do watch television. And the television stations, of course, are controlled uh, largely by political interests. So it depends what they're used to watching. Maybe not so different from America, maybe, after right, all. Right. Or other countries, but uh, social media reaches so many people because a very large part of the population uh, has a smartphone, some kind of internet enabled device, and they can certainly receive um, uh, tweets and, and, and send them and, and be very much engaged in that and check their Facebook. And that's all been a big part of this. And is largely positive or negative? On balance, I would say positive because, in general, more information, more light is better. But if that bright light is shining in your eyes because you're somebody who's trying to blind you with it, then of course that's not positive. And, and that's so it, it's been double edged, but on balance, positive. Uh, but it has to be said that the Parolo camp has used it better in general than the Jokowi camp, although Jokowi has some very brilliant individual allies. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's probably uh, given, delivered more for Parolo than it has for Jokowi. We talked earlier about ghosts of the past. Um, what are the ghosts? I mean, again, for me, the. Com comparing it again to 97, 98, I, you, I do f feel the ghosts are there. How would you describe this? Yeah, no, Indonesia is a land where, for, for, for most Indonesians, uh, the dead live alongside the living. You know, there is no boundary between the living and, and those who have passed on. It, they inhabit the same space and same time. And for this election, that's been very tangible. Uh, it, it's full of odd contrasts. We have Prabowo, this guy presenting himself as the tough Kendu leader, uh, who's been seized upon by radical Islamist groups as a champion of the, of the faithful. And, and I mean, Rice foolishly in, invoked the idea of the battle of, of, of Badr and so on. It's strange kinds of imagery, really rather sectarian. But Prabowo's mother is Christian. His younger brother, Hashim, the billionaire who's financing his campaign, is Christian, as other siblings. Uh, and the, the man he's channeling I I is not his former father-in-law, Suharto, but uh, Megawati's father, Sukarno, he, he's dressed in the same white uniform. Uh, at his campaign rally, he had the same 1950s-style microphones, the same uh, accompaniments and, 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 and clothing and artifacts. And, and he affects a kind of Sukarno-esque style of bombastic, soaring rhetoric and, and, and bold confidence uh, and, and crazy nationalism, frankly. Uh, so it's, it's a strange mixture of things. So in a sense, the ghost of Sukarno is with us. Of course, the ghost of Suharto is very much with us because uh, very literally the New Order may experience a, a significant resurrection come Wednesday for all our wins. Uh, and many of those who were in the Suharto New Order and still are alive and, and well have got a lot at stake. So somebody like Abu Riz al-Bakri, the businessman who some would say is more underwater than he is above the water in yeah. terms of his, his assets. He owes a lot of money. 
uh, he's banking on winning because he needs to pay back uh, a lot of debts. There are a lot of uh, Suharto-era kleptocrats uh, who, are, who are in this campaign. Um, and then there's a lot of personal rivalries too. So we see uh, going back to the New Order period, but even back to previous uh, reform era uh, governments, rivalries between um, Megawati and uh, Yudiono, who isn't present in this campaign, but he could have been helping the Jokowi camp if, if his relationship with Megawati was not so sour. I mean, if Megawati had accepted his overtures of, of reconciliation, he would be there backing uh, Jokowi in a way which could be and a Megawati game changer. And Megawati has played a strong role, albeit... Uh... Uh, absolutely. She's, she's been front and centre along with her daughter, Juan, and uh, that inspires a lot of excitement amongst the party faithful. But for those outside that small circle of party faithful, about probably 14% of all Indonesians, uh, there's a deep degree of ambivalence, if not antipathy. And, and so that's actually been a legacy uh, and a liability that's really hurt uh, Jokowi. If, if Megawati and, and Juan had stepped aside a little bit, uh, PDIP might have done them more service. But there's a lot of personal grudge matches going on. All of the major players, uh, all of the figures in, in all of the camp, in both camps, uh, have made serious mistakes, and the mistakes have largely to do with personal grudges. So Jokowi should really have uh, Party Democrat on board with him. Party Democrat, of course, should have had a candidate and a third coalition if they hadn't messed things up so badly. Uh, Golkar probably, uh, Mega was probably unwise to rebuff the approach of Abu Rizal Bakri because a Golkar coalition would have come at a, a fair price, right. but it would have firmed things up very nicely. Uh, as it is, uh, the opposition uh, that uh, Jokowi is facing has a parliamentary majority. Uh, they have 56% uh, of seats in parliament, and, and so that automatically uh, creates a liability. But it's mostly explained in terms of personal rivalries that go back through previous uh, administrations and previous governments. So there are a lot of ghosts in the room. Is it, is it fair to say this is 1999 all over again in many instances, or...? Not so much. I mean, it's 99 in the sense that it's in a very important turning, uh, turning point election. Um, uh, both the legislative result, which perhaps wasn't so significant, but really it sets up the presidential race, uh, and the presidential result certainly is very significant. Um, it's the most important election, the most important uh, democratic event uh, since, since 99. So in, in 15 years, this is where Indonesia perhaps gets a, a strong, fairly clean government that gets on with a task of growing the economy or ends up, uh, and this is possible with either candidate, uh, with a, um, a new government that's burdened by uh, personal ambitions and, and lack of teamwork and, and lack of clarity and lack of clear policy and, and perhaps um, a, a superficial uh, turn towards uh, nationalism that gets in the way of, of, of building uh, a strong growing, um, you know, this is supposed to be a, a, a emerging market tiger. At the moment, the tiger is looking a little bit anemic, uh, and, and this next government will determine whether the tiger rules again or not. And that's why it's really the economics of it, right? The fuel yeah, subsidies. Yeah, like most things in life, it comes down to economics. But uh, the World Bank had a report out um, a couple of weeks ago saying that Indonesia is in a good place, but if it's to avoid the so-called uh, middle income trap that's that's caught other countries, uh, it needs to have a growth not of between five and six percent, but of between seven and eight, or, or better than eight. But certainly, it needs to, to pull it up a few notches, and to do that, it needs uh, it needs investment in infrastructure, and that requires some degree of foreign direct investment. It needs to grow its manufacturing base. It doesn't have many middle-sized companies. It needs to do a lot better at building up its human capital, and that all requires a, a, a strong, clean government. Both candidates have pluses and minuses when it comes to delivering that, but a lot, you know, a lot is, is riding on who comes in. in it is a far different world today than it was in in '99. It's it, in many ways more complex uh, threats that are that you couldn't have thought about before. I mean, what kind of world? What are the main issues this new leader is going to have to face? Well, we're, we're living in, in in a world of the emerging markets, uh, and it's very much the world dominated by China and to a lesser extent India. India under 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 Modi, of course, may be entering a golden spot, which will put it up, you know, increases the level of competition for, for other Asian nations. Indonesia could be on a path to follow South Korea in economic development, uh, or it could experience that, you know, sort of um, Michael Jackson moon dance uh, 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 performance we've seen in the Philippines for so many decades, where there's a semblance of going forward, but nothing seems to change. I mean, to be fair to the Philippines, it's changed a bit lately, but that's, that's the dilemma. Is it to be the Philippines or is it to be South Korea? Uh, and it, it really requires strong, clear 
leadership, both in terms of the president and the team they can pull together. Um, Jokowi arguably has the better personal qualities, but may not have the team. Prabowo may be better able to deliver the team. Interesting. And let me go to security issues. Mm. Um, we have, we've seen a, a new mutation, the evolution of the threat that was once Al-Qaeda. Um, how would you describe this threat today and the, its impact on Indonesia and the region? Well, it's been popular over the last uh, decade to uh, try and write off Al-Qaeda. There's many ways of looking at Al-Qaeda and in, in some respects it's quite a minority phenomenon. But the movement of ideas and the movements of people and the related uh, organizations that have grown out of Al-Qaeda are now very considerable. And that sort of genie is out of the bottle and is at large. Indonesia has done a very good job tactically through the police of responding to terrorism. But it seems just as fast as they can track down groups and arrest them, or disrupt them, new ones pop up. And now with the, the global engine turned up quite a few notches with the conflict in Syria and Iraq, um, uh, sort of uh, given concrete form in this new caliphate uh, with ISIS or ISIL, uh, the uh, potential for it to draw many more people from the region into, uh, from Southeast Asia into the Middle East is, is considerable. It's, 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 I mean, even at the beginning of 2014, we didn't have a clear sense of this. By June, it's clear that the threat is very large. Those that aren't killed uh, because of their amateurness or, or their stupidity or bad luck uh, and who come back home will come back very battle-hardened and, and, and tough and, and probably deeply radicalised. And if the threat was persistent uh, in the past, it's going to be even tougher in the future. So that's going to re that's another one of the, the series of challenges facing an Indonesian president. Um, in terms of uh, the number of fighters that have gone to uh, to Syria, it's actually in more than the fighters who went to... Yeah, it, it, we would have said at the end of 2013 that more had gone to Syria in two years, foreign fighters from Europe and across Asia and elsewhere, uh, than had gone to Afghanistan in a decade. Today, in June 2014, we'd say that the numbers are, are vastly larger, that the, there are, is a, the, there are um, you know, perhaps as many as 20,000 foreign fighters gone off to the region, and that number may be rising sharply because of what's happening in, in Iraq. Uh, and that changes things completely. When foreign fighters went to uh, Afghanistan, they were called the Mujahideen, but for the most part, they were not really fighters. They were stuck in camps in some remote valley getting endless indoctrination and you know basic training but not seeing much frontline experience. Foreign fighters who go to Syria and Iraq today, if they, if they survive, uh, will come back with a lot of frontline experience and probably a lot of tradecraft, basic skills in, in terms of soldiering and improvised uh, guerrilla fighting, and including making IEDs and so on. And, and so that's a, a whole different level of threat. But we know with Afghanistan that the whole problem facing Southeast Asia, the rise of Jama'a Islamia and the related networks, um, came out of the Afghanistan experience. And, and what's happening now in Syria and Iraq, and, and possibly we'll see connections in the future with, with Egypt and, and Yemen and beyond. Uh, and now we're seeing the whole of the Sahel and Northern Africa uh, embroiled with the same problems. We're likely to see very much greater degree of problems um, in, in, the, in the coming decades. Are governments in the region prepared for this? Are they looking at it? Uh, governments in the region, like governments everywhere, are tired of this problem. Um, the former Australian Prime Minister uh, famously declared that um, you know we're, we're beyond the 9/11 decade. Yes. Um, well, uh, no doubt she was genuine in her sentiment, uh, but the reality is, yes, yeah, so the decade has has come and gone, but the Al Qaeda threat the movement, the, the, the sort of the jihadi global movement, is, is a bigger problem than it's ever been before. Uh, ISIS in itself is probably the, the, the most successful al-Qaeda splinter uh, that, that's ever existed. It's controlling territory, has large numbers of people. Uh, it may be brittle and may fail eventually, but it's still going to be a very inspira inspirational force. And so the, the trouble in Southeast Asia is getting worse, not better. But governments are tired. They would like to pretend that it's a problem solved. In Muslim majority Indonesia, it's a tough challenge. It always has been for for um, social and political leaders here to to face up to uh, the need to, to crack down on extremist uh, activism that's you know on the edge of legality and it's inciting people to go off to Syria or elsewhere. And it's just been put in the too hard basket, somebody else's problem. And I think you know, this next government's going to have to deal with it. And the last question on this is, the t is social media and in the internet, what role is it playing in, in the evolution of the threat that was once known as Al-Qaeda? Well, it's, it's very much, I mean, modern terrorism is, is all about uh, winning the hearts and minds it, for both sides, for all sides involved. For those countering it, they have to win hearts and minds of the broad population. And for the terrorists, the hearts and mind piece comes via the internet, uh, whether 
directly through websites and, 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 and chat sites or through social media, including Twitter, but certainly Facebook has, has, has been a very useful vehicle, YouTube, for delivering fiery sermons that we may scoff at. But for young, we're talking about teenagers and, and, and 20-something young men for the most part, they find this inspirational. These are the cool guys. Uh, their local uh, imam or ustaz or religious teacher uh, is not cool. The guy on the internet is cool. The guy on the YouTube station is cool. And, and they're, you know, they're responding to it. Okay, and, and this is the last question on, on Wednesday. Um, I asked you at the beginning what's at stake for Indonesia. When Indonesians go to the polls on Wednesday, whether emotional or rational, what is the choice ahead for them? In crude terms, it is a return to a new order style of rather more authoritarian, rather more uh, kleptocratic governance, or a leap into the unknown uh, with, with a, a nice guy, but you're just not quite sure whether he's got the whole thing together in the form of Jokowi. Uh, I think at the end, Indonesians will choose to leave the new order behind. And if Prabowo fails on Wednesday, that may well be the last hurrah of the new order team. Um, but it may well be the case that uh, the new order comes back resurrected in the form of a parole government. It won't be Suharto all over again. It'll be shades of Sukarno as well. It's the ghosts of the past. Um, and it'll be a team of people with lots of uh, liabilities and personal interests. And, and that will burden the new government if it's a parole government. It may burden the new government if it's a Jokowi government. But it'll be a cleaner break with the past with a Jokowi government.